Hello, we are here. It is Thursday. Uh, <laughs> Good intro. Yes, um... <laughs> uh, but, uh, I suppose, is this still technically Starman and the Boomer? I don't know. It's, it's something. It's it's our stream. People know what it is. It's esoteric. It's it's deliberately dense sometimes. People don't care. They're still turning up, which I'm quite glad of. Um, I'm fine yes. one as well. Is, yes, we are here. <laughs> here is where we are. Has Trig still got man flu then? Uh, I think he's just busy today. Ah, right. Um, he'll be doing the stream on Saturday, uh, for those interested. I'll be streaming Saturday, probably about 10 p.m., because we have a U.S. guest. But it'll be me and Trig, and we'll be talking about Le Ghost Guns with... Um, oh, I, I wish I could... I, I'll actually, I'll, I'll link him... Um, in the chat in a sec when i find it but it's uh it's mr it's the guy who runs a a twitter called uh, rk spookware he's pretty cool apparently he's a fan of the show so we will be streaming with him on saturday which would be kind of cool and getting the channel um, banned <laughs> yes well yeah they're just speaking of which the, <clears throat> the channel twitter has unfortunately been removed for my crimes against cyclists um, weird that's what got it but yeah i uh i made a gas the bikes joke well yeah um, you're you're not even allowed to say that people should be not alive anymore on twitter so it was a very low-end joke though that's the thing yeah the channel twitter is gone and it's because i made a back gas the bikes race car now joke so we are we are now officially on telegram for good <laughs> yes um for those who don't know i'm uh I'm here to let you know we do have a Telegram channel. I posted it in the community section previously, but um, if those noises are correct, that might be Evelyn posting it in the chat there. I'm not sure. Um, oh, that should work. Yep. There we go. We we do have the Telegram. So if you guys want to join us on Telegram, um, we will be posting there and updating there pretty regularly. I think. I think it's a better place to gain traction. There's a lot more of the you dedicated guys there. I've seen yes. some of you regular chat people there which is nice it's nice to talk to our uh well, our dedicated viewers i was gonna say i think a big chunk of the people who are regular watchers have probably already watched me sit there giving out schizo rants on telegram for the last few weeks anyway but for the stragglers who are not already <laughs> yes yes um and i'll be joining with content more there now that i've finally been uh thrown off the twitters again once once uh, you get a hang of how you t to use it a bit more as it it's not too bad really it's better than bloody gab i'll tell you that for sure cannot cannot stand gab really falling out with mines to be honest mm. um so i'm i'm gonna try and switch my efforts over more to telegram uh, no one was shilling. I'll put it in the chat as the pinned message, but this is the best place to send your questions and donations. Uh, Streamlabs takes a smaller cut than YouTube does, but if you do insist on using YouTube, we do have memberships and Super Chat still available somehow. We don't actually get sanctioned on YouTube. Um, I, don't th I think we've just not been noticed. We have like a security through obscurity thing going on here. Yeah. Which I'm kind of glad of, to be honest. I... I, I don't know. A lot of people get depressed with their reach not growing. I'm just glad to, you know, kind of still be here. Because mm. a lot of the alternate platforms like Odyssey and stuff are kind of a pain. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, at least, at least, I, I honestly think we're only still here because I have an account that dates from 2007 and is in good standing. And they usually, like, put, they have, like, some weird behind-the-scenes trust rating. And I think mine has, like, a weirdly high trust rating. So it's gonna be take quite a lot to erode that maybe. But that's just a guess because we don't know. Yeah. Anyway. We, we could wake up tomorrow and it just won't be here anymore and I don't know, we'll start just like uploading ramblings onto like Substack or something like that. We'll 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 find a way. I actually have um an Odyssey account. I have a lot I have accounts basically on all the alt tech just lurking. Mm -hmm. Um I just don't use them because I don't like to split our audience too heavily, which is fine. Um Yes, I see you, Travis Wolf. Um, uh, yeah, the the mines thing. I tried using it quite heavily for a while, about six months ago, I think, mm. maybe maybe about a year ago, and it's just dead. Unfortunately, mines is just dead. So, um, but we should we we've got the shillings out of the way. We should probably talk about the topic of the video. Uh, I was Unless gonna... you have anything else to to share, Evelyn. Uh, I was going to quickly say thank you to all the people who are members and stuff of the channel. Because it is very yes. handy that they contribute to us regularly. 
Uh, I don't know. It I th- is. I had someone else asking me about other ways that we might look about that. And I think I'd mentioned before, and we 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 might need to discuss it more about using Substack as a way to paywall things. And the only issue I have with that is we aren't in a position really where we can guarantee regular content. So I'm no, not. No, I I'd like us to get into a better position before we start doing anything yeah. like that. Really. Um, I don't know. I, the thing yeah. is, I understand part of that transitionary period is it kind of getting paid to make semi regular con or semi irregular content anyway because you 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 know it kind of goes hand in hand but I don't know we'll continue chipping away and doing as we have done in streams and writing stuff and whatever else we we come up with so uh well the topic of today's video is all oh, very old news actually we're talking about something that happened way back in uh, in 2016 and really started long, long before that. But I think the cutoff point of what we're talking about today is probably about 2015. Yeah. I've I've had the notes for this <clears throat> since I saw it, since I actually saw the closure about you know six years ago. Sorry, you you saw it. I saw it. Yes. <laughs> Did you saw it like you would a drawing? Oh no! Stop making fun of my accent. Um. <laughs> But, but yeah, I saw it uh, when it happened. I've been fascinated with it ever since because it is a very interesting worked example of like the end point of legislating uh, something away that mm. you're not technically supposed to be able to, especially on like a local level like this. You have this kind of microcosm of somewhere like San Francisco, which is really the pos petri dish. It is as we've seen, merely further along the pipeline because they've had so much greater total control there yeah. to an extreme degree um, to the point that they have managed to not only make it an extremely unfriendly environment to something like a gun store, but to actually make it impossible legally to to operate one within within the city limits of San Francisco. Well, um, th- I think maybe it's worth mentioning this also slightly ties into... The stream we did a few weeks ago now about the uh, what was it the Infinite Council House or the Infinite Council Estate, yes, with uh, Sadiq Khan because it was there was sort of a similar theme there whereby a an extra piece of of governance on top of national governments or in this case federal governance, it's is applying a, a further arm of laws to have its own power base so as to in the case of the London mayoral elections and the, their uh, assembly, t- turning the council housing schemes in London into a racket and essentially yes. forcing private constructors or uh, legislating private constructors completely out of business if they wish to actually sell housing to individuals as opposed to large social care institutions or whatever else. So in the same it sense does- here, you know, there is the... Instead of just banning building private houses, they, they legislated out the possibility of doing it. And, and the same thing is happening here. So that instead of just an outright gun ban, there is the slow but sure death by legislation of firearms trading. Well, there's another story I'd like to go over at some point as well that will link into this. about the. There's an infamous story about the planning permission or the equivalent of planning permission in the US of a laundromat that was supposed mm. to be changed into really just a couple of apartments. Uh, and that's a great example of like the local racket that goes on in someone like San Francisco. But we should we, let's get into the background here because would you prior like to start to, with the trace article? Yes, prior to 2016, this is an article from July 2015, seven years ago, in the in the, in a website called the Trace, which is basically uh, an NGO run by Michael Bloomberg to Oof. try and uh, yes, <laughs> it, yes. It's an NGO-derived website from Michael Bloomberg uh, trying to tell us that guns are terrible, but doing it in a like in, in a weirdly like false neutrality way. It is specifically an anti-gun lobby website, but they do pieces like this where they try and you know, they they look at the gun industry, gun shops, and gun owners 
like like Michael Bloomberg looks at anyone whose whose last name isn't Berg. <laughs> you know, it it's it's very much they look at these as like the other, the outside, and almost with like a weird fascination. Mm. Like the the honest the tone of the trace is like gun owners belong in a zoo almost. Um, yeah, they they should be studied and therapeutically managed out of society. You know, the, their yes. problem isn't with guns per se, it's the attitude of gun owners in America, that kind of crap. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, this is just called Inside San Francisco The Last Gun Shop. And it's the God. only real profile I could find of High Bridge Arms. The, 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 the first uh, paragraph already. High Bridge Arms, a gun shop in San Francisco, California, is located in a white stucco building on Mission Street in the upscale neighbourhood of Bernal Heights. There is a stunning park nearby with massive red cliffs overlooking the city and for the medically inclined, a marijuana dispensary down the street. <laughs> That'll come into play later. Um, the store, which was operated quietly for decades, recently made the news when a city supervisor proposed a new set of requirements for firearms dealers in response to a series of violent crimes. The proposal mandates that the city gun shops, or in this case, city gun shop, because mm. this is now targeted legislation at this single store. Film all transactions and, on a weekly basis, uh, send sales data to the San Francisco police. Blowback is not expected from the city's firearms merchant. There is only one, Hybrid Jams. And it already follows many of these rules on its own. Um, we already have 24-7 uh, surveillance in the, in the building, uh, in and out, says so Steve Alco. Uh, uh, 41, the shop's longtime general manager. Um, it kind of goes into a bit of the stuff here. Um, it's actually owned by a, a fascinating figure called Takahashi, who's not someone uh, from some of the other interviews I've seen, which have sadly been memory hold. Um, this is not a a store that makes any kind of money. Mm. Uh, they only sell maybe a couple of thousand guns a year in a city of millions. I can um, imagine. <laughs> yes, and they are already very much under attack by the city itself it, you'd probably be very very um pushed to find any of the guns being used in violent crime in somewhere like san francisco would come from this store simply because it's it's a it's a boutique store well, and a boutique I, I was gonna say you know it's like it's like how we we go and visit like tobacconists in like manchester yeah. or wherever we are doing something you know you, no one, the average person isn't going in there and is picking out four or five cigars and, you know, uh, is going to go start a fire with them or something silly like that. Or go, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the, in the same sense here, it's, you know, being the nature of the fact that it's the one left, you know, I would imagine it's very much a, a store ordered it, or, sorry, organised towards either vintage firearms or very specific hunting and sporting gear. Yes. It'll be like what gun stores are like in the UK, which is you've maybe got a couple of dozen rifles on the rack and the back wall behind the till, and the rest of it's all just expensive jackets and stuff. <laughs> and like big outdoor survival knives. I, I love that they call San Francisco a paragon of liberalism. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's quite <laughs> funny. Uh, a lot of the, yeah, it basically it's a tourist attraction. I wonder if this Tashi, uh, Takahashi guy liked uh, Mishima. Takahashi is approximately five feet tall, and in 1974 he was ranked the number two powerlifter in Northern California. 74 being the year that Yukio Mishima committed suicide, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's he's he's kind of a fascinating figure. Um, uh, now in his 70s, a picture hangs on the shop's wall of him in his prime, deadlifting several hundred pounds. He was pretty strong, Al, Car Al Cairo says. <laughs> He's just this doddering old guy who owns the shop and kind of just has refused to let it die, even though it's not really a going concern. Um, that's kind of the state we find ourselves in in 2015. And this is, as, you, as we've said, the only gun store in San Francisco at this point. Mm. So any gun laws that they pass are targeted specifically at hybrid arms. Well, in, <laughs> in the sense of looking at purely like the sort of San Francisco district. Yeah. As it were. Yes. Um, and as we've already established, well, we'll talk about it later, but as we've already established, it basically would be impossible for another gun store to open in San Francisco. You would never get the planning, you know, you'd never get the planning permission. 
Um, let's let's move on to the next one. Then we can kind of track the arc of where this goes. Uh, this is from the Gun Chronicle article. It's the Guns.com one. Oh, uh, let me quickly go and find that. I'll put it put it in the general chat. Here you go. That's all right. No, I've it's... got the link. Uh, sheet is just I didn't have that one open. Uh, cool. It's Guns.com from July, so about a month after the previous uh, profile was written about uh, hybrid jams. And this is, San Francisco seeks to videotape all gun sales, allow police to track. Um, and it, what it would do is, in the wake of the murder of an illegal alien uh, with a gun stolen from a federal agent, <laughs> the, San Fran- mm, the San Francisco <laughs> Board of Supervisors is pushing a strict new gun control initiative. Supervisor Mark Farrell is asking the city's uh, attorney's office to draft the legislation requiring gun stores operating in the city to video all gun and ammo sales. Basically, though, it, it went a lot further. And you'd have to, like, videotape the person, like, directly in the face almost. Um, basically, what they said was that they need to also transmit data along with this video. It's the date of the transaction, the name and address, and, and date of birth, the transferee, the number of transactions, the brand type and caliber, signature, name, blah, blah, blah. But basically, what it would do is it would... It's like, make... the, it's like buying your guns and ammunition with a blockchain. <laughs> yeah, basically, yes. It would, it would create what would be considered an onerous bureaucratic and legal burden on um, hybrid jobs. Farrell points to similar laws in Chicago adopted in recent months. How did they work? How did um, that go? Yeah. But the thing is, um, um, hmm. Chicago underwent a similar trajectory, although Chicago hasn't really had functioning gun stores for about a decade. Because hmm. uh, basically what happened is the... Uh, the local politicians went round and, and told people, you won't sell guns because, you know, Chicago is Chicago, but it didn't move the needle at all. Um, but what happened, yeah, what happened in San Francisco is such a good case study because it's, there's a great arc here. And there's, a, there's a great way to track all of this. It's a, it's a great worked example. And I'm glad, I'm glad we're kind of able to do this and not have to keep going back to headlines Mm. Um, because we can sit back and go, here's how we got here. Here's a great example of what happened. Um, and the latest push for gun control in the Golden Gate City comes only days after the high profile oh, murder of Catherine uh, Stenile on San Francisco, uh, on San Francisco's iconic, apparently, for Pier 14. Um, undocumented alien. Yeah, use the handgun stone for a federal agent. Um, of the city of some nearly 830,000 contains a single gun shop. Uh, the staff isn't enamored with the proposed new rules, yeah. Uh, no wonder. It is, <laughs> yeah. It, it basically means that they can, at any point, remove records, remove video without subpoena. Um, that's the, another big, a big thing here is this, this undermines subpoena laws and privacy laws quite heavily. Um, and the, the most onerous law that stands is where the boundary of the law is. Um, that's another thing to keep in mind with all of this. All of this <laughs> is apparently compatible with the second amendment Yes, and all of this is possible under the U S constitution whether you believe it's being adhered to or not. This is it in practice. Um, so that's that's the law that was proposed. On top of everything else, on top of California's existing gun laws, on top of what we will see uh, coming in uh, 2016, um, which is the the background checks on ammunition, which has caused abject chaos. Um, we see the proposed law here of basically them creating a situation in which the lone gun store in San Francisco will have to victimize its customers and essentially humiliate them. Well, yeah, um, the, you now have to treat your own patrons as possible criminals because the government said so. Yes. It's, it's a very, it kind very of obviously sh- targeted law. It kind of shows how, how desperate sometimes they get trying to work these, we you know, the these bumps and, and cracks out of the perfected sort of image they would want to see of somewhere like San Francisco. 
you know, yeah. we'll, we'll just we'll just survey the gun store until they give us an excuse to get rid of them, or we'll you know as as we're going to get into, let's not even necessarily have to actually have a reason to go in. Let's just legislate their business out of operation entirely, <laughs> and and make them treat their own customers like scum. Well, here's here's the story. Inevitably, in September twenty fifteen, the... are we on the Chronicle one now? Oh no. Um, either the San Francisco Chronicle or the SF Gate one. They're both pretty good. Uh, I've got um, both here. Uh, just get get the Chronicle one up first. Cool. Um, because that has that has some nice little bits in it. I would say. Um, this one's from October. The I think the other one's from late September. But yeah. basically, in late September 2015, Highbridge Arms makes the decision that it can no longer operate within the San Francisco metro area because of this onerous new law, mm. because it feels it wouldn't be fair to its customers to expose their privacy like that. It wouldn't be fair to their customers to humiliate them like that. Um, but the story goes, Bay Area, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, San Francisco's last gun shop gives up the fight. Um, yeah, The last gun from the last gun shop in San Francisco has been sold. Without a single bullet. Um, <laughs> Elliot Eisenberg, <clears throat> 70, wouldn't have known what to do with ammunition anyway. He was uh, printing flyers at, at Copy Central on Mission Street last week when he noticed the sign in the windows and on Highbridge saying final sale. He went inside for a look and left with a receipt for a Colt 45. Um, Extremely thanks. boomer move. He spent yeah, twelve hundred quid on a nineteen, uh, twelve hundred dollars on a nineteen eleven. Oh, better be a nice one. It it might even be like a single action, <laughs> like in a San Francisco. Yeah, um, <laughs> do you, like it, well, that's how much they cost in San Francisco. But yeah, that's the last weapon. Um, my purpose is not violence. Beautiful, blah 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 blah. Normal liberal kind of bullshitting. Um, yeah, Hybrid Jam, the last six gun shop is closed because of a new city ordinance that required gun sellers to video record all commercial firearm sales. As well as gonna, the police to buy. I was going to look at one quick bit here. They just go, yeah, thanks for supporting the last gun shop in San Francisco, blah, blah, blah. I had never held a gun before, let alone owned one. But he's the last person to buy a firearm legally in San Francisco. Like, they're, yeah. just, they're just straight up being like, yep, that's it. Like, fuck you. <laughs> It's almost more of a work part than it is a weapon. He said, "Ugh." Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's the that's the bit that gets me. It's very, it's very cosmopolitan. Hey, is that but, is that hoppers that says in that little box there in the image below? I'm not sure. Hoppers patches. <laughs> it looks like it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll let you go back I, to reading. <laughs> I like the little caveat of legally there. Mm. Like, they know. They oh. know that illegal firearm sales happen in San Francisco probably every single day. Um, at least on the outskirts. It's a city of 830,000 people. Probably more now. Oh, the, um, the, the, Well, that's, I think, the thing is we, we always get, like, the... We get, like, the Skid Row version of San Francisco shown to us, which isn't really even the worst part. That's just, like, where no. the homeless people live at certain parts of the year. <clears throat> if I'm right in saying, the further south you really go, as far as it's still Bay Area is concerned, the worse and worse it gets. And before you know it, you're basically in Crackton. Yes. It's here we go. The legal battle over guns. This is a good little profile of really what's been done in San Francisco specifically. Uh, Highbridge Arms' unlikely survival has played a role in shaping gun control across the uh, across the country. The shop has inspired several restrictive San Francisco only gun laws, only some of which have been upheld have held by the courts. In 2014, a ban on the possession of high capacity magazines was upheld, but others have failed, such as Proposition H. That's, that's kind of funny, because it's so close to preparation. Anyway, um, the complete ban <laughs> on handguns was approved by voters in 2000. There we go. That was, this is one of the ordinances I wanted to talk about. Um, there was a San Francisco ballot initiative, as they call the direct democracy stuff, mm. in, uh, in California, uh, that, was, that was passed in 2005 simply in, uh, in, in San Francisco. That would allow them to completely ban the sale of handguns. Um, yeah, but the National Rifle Association sued on behalf of 
gun dealers and owners. They won in court, and the initiative never took effect. Uh, more recently, the U.S. Supreme Court maintained in June that a San Francisco law banning the sale of bullets uh, that splinter or expand upon contact, basically they banned defensive ammunition. Mm. Um, and then they're saying that was legal. So the Supreme Court said that you can basically limit ammunition to the degree that you want. But the actual full ban on handguns itself was not upheld. That's why they had to go this route, really. Mm. I think um, it, it goes to show, though, that you know that this is the you know the I think possibly one of the best examples of this phenomenon we could find. That whether the people that were involved in the vote really believed it or not. 51% of the, the voting majority in state issue elections in California, yeah. which I'd imagine is nowhere near approaching actual majority of the people, but not like that matters anyway. I've just decided that you as a, a person cannot carry something that you can easily defend yourself with on a daily basis. And it, it's the, the whole thing of... Uh, Hopper suggesting in much of the work that he puts together that, you know, an insurance company turns around to you and says, you know, well, you can live in this house, but you have to give up your right to bear arms. Well, the uh, the fact that this was a proposition is is an interesting one, because it seems to be what they do with laws that they can't get passed via, via council votes. It's an, What I've seen in my research here is an interesting mix of denying direct democracy because they'll know they'll lose and using it in very specific cases where they want to get through laws yes. they otherwise wouldn't. Um, like the handgun law, which I think they knew would probably get shut down in the courts, but it's kind of a haggling, it's the most extreme position. But that, that's looking... how they, they then argue that they've got a democratic mandate to continue further, you know, yeah. gun restrictions or however they want to phrase it. <clears throat> well... Proposition H, which was on the ballot with a whole bunch of other ballots, which meant that the quote unquote turnout would be higher than you'd expect on a simple kind of single vote issue. The in a city of eight hundred and fifty thousand people, uh only two hundred thousand of them actually voted on this initiative. And it passed with about 120,000 votes in agreement with it. It was about a fifty three percent to forty percent, it says here. Um, so in a city of 850,000 people, 123,000 people decided that the rest of the population cannot buy handguns at all, and that apparently was legal. Yep, uh, they, they have decided that they don't want their neighbours to be able to defend themselves, and bo possibly them as well, which is kind of the really strange thing about it, when you start thinking about it in that way, that you know, th these people have actively voted to have their ability to self-determine as a community stripped away from them. Now, you know, that's, the, the, again, the, the lie that you're always sold when you vote democratically is that you're engaging in self-government and you're engaging in self-determination, which you're actually stripping away your, your ability to persist as a group under repression. Well, it's, it's again, it's, they couldn't get the handgun law passed. So they had to get this law passed. This mm. really is, it, it, like you said, it's a perfect example of the fact that if people have an agenda, they will, by hook or by crook, make it happen. Um, and if they are in power, no matter what the legal precedent is, no matter what a piece of paper says, if you get a group of people in power who can say that they represent the majority opinion, you will always get this erosion to this point. You will always either be straight up banned Wait, or legislated. Hold, hold the bus, I've just noticed something here. He goes on to talk about, it's a seemingly unpopular business to most said Al, Al Cairo, who's worked at the store since 2005, but we have a right to self-protection. It's as plain as day to me. The city has no right to tell me what I need to protect myself and how I should protect myself any more than I have a right to tell anyone they can't be married. It's a shame this business is folding. Was Proposition H the, also the same one that had gay marriage on it and... No, no, that was a different proposition, I think. Right. That's about the same... It's just the fact that he's gone and mentioned that there, though. That must have it's been about the time, time frame, yes. this was all being debated. and like, Because as, as we might get further into in this stream, the, the way in which the, the, the sort of assemblies in California and their local, legisla lo local legislatory board has acted as the, the forefront for all sort of progressive American... Uh, legislation, especially in this terms of 
gun control. But I, 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 I would, I'd be interested to come back and see how much work was done on testing, you know, how to normalize people to gay marriage in California in the same way that, it, that you know, were these methods then used and extended onto statewide when the whole federal thing came in about it. I, don't know. I just that caught my eye there, and I was wondering whether or um, not that's a coincidence. <laughs> oh, we have a great throwback here. It's one of the earliest supporters of the channel here. Uh, the firearm himself, HK9410. It's it's good to see you on a on a firearm theme stream. He said, "I've said it before, and I'll say it during my 2032 Vermin Supreme Tier presidential campaign. God. California should be nuked into oblivion, and nothing of value will be lost." Th thank you, Mr. HK9410. Very based. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm thinking about bucks. some. Some prime time coral reef properties just right about where the Bay Area is or was. <laughs> uh, we're just waiting for that not that one big more earthquake and all of Ellie included just all go into the sea. Well, I've read it, sorry, I've read it through a lot, but the, actually the FF, SFG article doesn't have anything else to add to it, really. Cool. Um, I don't think really uh there's a couple of extra pictures in the fox news one but there isn't really a lot added to it uh abc one uh worth looking at oh, before I, we get into... yeah i was just going to go over a couple of points here and that it doesn't actually matter if this law had failed in the courts or not i don't know if anyone did try and sue it is sue the city of san francisco um because since hybrid arms has announced its closure it's a moot point uh, there are no gun shops in California now. Yes. So de facto, there will be no gun sales. Sorry, in San Francisco now, sorry. So de facto, there will be no gun sales in San Francisco. So repealing the laws wouldn't do anything because, as we said, because of um, San Francisco's extremely restrictive planning structure, you would never be able to turn that store back into a gun store. Um, well, we'll get on to what it became later because uh, it's it's slightly well it's it's very california ironic what actually happened in the end um yes q q tool tool enema um, <laughs> um but we should what we should do is have a quick look at uh use as a springboard really because this the, is a good example of the, the ABC bleeding edge news one Right, um, I'm, we've switched computers here, uh, but we are back. It's just me for the moment. I'm afraid, I think. Right, um, I'm, we've switched computers here, uh, but sorry, we are I'm back. I'm afraid we think that there might have been some sort of Windows update that's happened, um, which is kind of annoying, but um, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Evelyn, the computer at Evelyn's house, or at our house really, has decided to uh, has decided to update Windows. And uh, apologies for the echo there. I had the stream playing in the background uh, just to make sure it was actually running. Um, but I I have returned, and I will be continuing solo for now uh, until Evelyn can come back from the Windows update. Uh, right. Let's let's actually get the uh, stream in a different window here, otherwise I won't be able to keep track of everything. Um, I am still able to track the donations, don't worry. This is why you have some redundancy built in. <laughs> and also some uh, different bits and pieces. Do I have a preview pane here? I might have to actually send some, set some stuff up here. So I'm going to have to get rid of of these. I was recording something previously with different settings. So let's get rid of these. And there we go. Now the last store. <laughs> I'm having to set this back up on the fly. Um, but we will, we will actually have uh, sources here. I can Yo, ABC7, and we're completely back. Um, yeah, I don't know what's happening. The thing is, Windows turns it back on, unfortunately. But Evelyn will be back when the update has uh, 
has ceased. But here we go. Uh, San Francisco unanimously passes new committee bill aiming to prohibit sale of ghost guns. Um, even though there are no uh, ghost guns in California, well, in San Francisco, legally able to be transferred to people within the city because there is no FFL within the city limits, which is, I'm, I'm sure, as we can all tell, completely insane. Um, but the issue, the issue comes that they are still going. There are no more gun stores in San Francisco. And, you know, it's very, I have no mouth and I am a scream. It's, you know, I, ha I have no gun stores and I must still legislate. <laughs> but here we are. I think this really is to do with out-of-state sales and the, uh, the attempt to stop people from buying what are considered incomplete firearms, in quotes. Basically, it's a loophole. Uh, well, a loophole considered by the Democrats anyway. They, it's a quote-unquote loophole in which people can buy incomplete firearms, like incomplete receivers, drill them out, use a drill press, maybe use like a Dremel or a, a mill if you're feeling fancy, and they will be able to order these kits and essentially manufacture a firearm. Um, it, it's something that's been protected under the Second Amendment ever since its inception. It's something very, very common and was very, very common in frontier days especially, because most people actually made their own muzzle loaders, or they had local gunsmiths make them for them, or at least they maintained them and would repair them if things went wrong. That is that is a very common practice in the US, or at least it was a very common practice in the US until relatively recently. Um, what we what we have here in the, with the city audience, ordinance, sorry, this is 2021. This is six years almost after the last gun store in the city is closed. Um, so San Francisco may soon be the first California city to ban the sale of ghost guns. Those are asking, ghost guns is like a buzzword. It's like a salt weapon. It's like, um, any, you know, you know uh, ghost gun very much is... It's like all those ill-defined legal terms. It's like, you know, military weapon of war and all that stuff. It's really just to scare people. There is no real clear legal definition of what is and is not a ghost gun, um, which is by design, I would say. Uh, currently, California law allows when to sell disassembled ghost gun kits without a serial number on the basis the purchaser will obtain a serial number from the Department of Justice within 10 days of assembling. As you can imagine, nobody is doing that, said funny well they're they're technically breaking the law is the issue if you manufacture a firearm for personal use and you sell it you're meant to put a serial number on it but under federal law if you're not going to sell it to anyone it's just your firearm and you can legally own a firearm that's none of the government's business and it's like that with anything it's it's creating a situation in which you can break federal law with a file and a drill in your house. I mean, you can do that anyway if you're skilled enough, let's be fair. Uh, there's a lot of people out there making the... Uh, we'll totally talk about those. Yeah, we're talking about 80% receivers, partially. But we're also... The, the problem is with the ghost gun is that what they class as a quote-unquote untraceable firearm, which is classed as a ghost gun, are also guns that have their serial numbers filed off. They class those in the same class as ghost guns when you... Uh, when you total up the, the, the deaths from ghost guns that come out for the Department of Justice. I'll be talking about this quite heavily on Saturday with, uh, with Mr. Spookware. Um, but we will, we will go through that in more detail then. This, this stream isn't really about ghost guns, it's about uh, gun legislation. But San Francisco's uh, Police Department's Crime Guns Investigation Center explained that during Thursday's hearing, most gun vendors didn't necessarily inform purchasers of these requirements. Again, this is hilarious because uh, San Francisco has no gun vendors. <laughs> um, they're, they're talking about guns that would be shipped in from out of state and then picked up at an FFL outside of San Francisco. So the sale of ghost guns is to do with the fact that these aren't legally firearms. Under federal law, they're not firearms. These are pieces of plastic and pieces of metal. Um, and you will see it again, like I said, in the uh, in the stream I'll be doing. Oh, excuse me. 
the stream I were doing on uh, on Saturday. But it's a redefinition. It allows them to essentially claim that any object can and is a firearm if they decide it so. It really stretches the legal definition of what is and isn't a firearm and what is and isn't firearms components. It's very different um, because here in the UK, we actually don't class certain things as restricted. Like magazines, for instance, you can actually buy, I know, I know Count Dankler talks about this, you can actually buy AK magazines on the open market in some places. And that's completely fine because nobody really here could use them. There aren't really any AK-47s in the country, and it's not a restricted part. It's a metal box with a spring in it. Uh, but in other countries, in Northern Ireland, for example, I think magazines are restricted because they do have uh, working firearms that could possibly take them. And it's, it's a hodgepodge of what someone does and doesn't say is a, quote-unquote, firearm. And again, ghost guns can't legally be sold in San Francisco because no gun can be legally sold in San Francisco because there are no gun stores to sell them in San Francisco. Um, it's a complete uh, kind of abstraction here when you get into it. It's them passing law really for the sake of passing law and then worrying about things coming in from outside of their jurisdiction. What they're really doing here is San Francisco is attempting to legislate the entirety of California from its legislature because what will happen is that you know, the, it, the point is moot now because of the federal stuff that's been passed. But if this passed and no other law passed, it would make it very difficult for 80% receiver manufacturers to operate in California. Because you'd end up in a situation where if your customer took the weapon itself into San Francisco, you'd technically be breaking city ordinance. But it wouldn't do a meter outside of city limits. Right, um, hello. Hello, yes. Through uh, through hey. definition of how the weapon is defined, where uh, I'm actually streaming at the moment, um, yeah. I was able to change uh, it pretty quickly. Yeah, would you, would you like me to switch it back over just so we've got the filters and everything else all working? Uh, yeah, that'd probably be better. I probably have my desktop audio up quite high. She's probably quite loud. So say something else, just so I can balance it again. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello, you were probably hello. extremely loud when you came in there. Apologies, guys. I was trying to re record something from a YouTube video that was extremely quiet a, few, a couple of days ago. But yes, um, you should. Pr we should probably switch over. Um, it, we're going to go away uh, for a sec here, guys, but we'll be back. So I'm going to stop streaming, and Evelyn's going to restart streaming. So we'll be changing over in just a second. Wait, I've stopped and started again. <laughs> ah, there we go. It seems to be coming through now, I'd say. Uh, yes, there we go. I believe we are coming through now. Hey, you refreshed, guys. Um, I know you can't hear me if you're not refreshed, but uh, it's, sorry, that's uh, that's kind of a moot one. There we go, we've managed the changeover. You will need to reload the window though. We have a blank screen currently. No, no, I'm, I'm currently getting the Google document up and whatever. I was, uh, what are, um, but yeah, as at? I was talking, I've, I've talked through people, I've talked through uh, with people watching about the ghost gun issue. Uh, so um, are you wanting that US Law Shield one then? Um yes. Yes. The the US Law Shield. Oh, no no the, the the legislation sponsored by Gavin Newsom is the one I want up next really. Cool. The yeah. uh, the one from the, the Office of the Governor is I'll get uh, up is in, I think in backwards order then. Uh, yes. and quickly fix the OBS. Yes, there we go. Cool. Um, but no, so, we, we, what sorry. we were discussing really uh, is the is the fact that uh, San Francisco, despite having no gun stores, is still passing gun laws. Yes. Um, on, you know, and restrictions on the sale of guns, which, it, as I talked about just just then, it's actually an attempt to wag the dog of California, yes, as San Francisco often does. This this is what I meant about the. Uh... The, the the sort of amendments they had on gay rights and stuff like that prior to federal policy on those issues. Hopefully the VOD on this won't be too compromised. Um, uh, not... It will probably just cut out bits where it's all over the place. Even if yeah, it, it... it might just mean you need to download the VOD and cut some choppy bits out or something. It, sh it should be okay, but yeah, I'm hoping it's not too bad. 
Oh, we we do need to. I'm afraid the the venerable old laptop is coming to the end of its life. I think. <laughs> it's my it's my it's my hands, isn't it? It's my uh, bizarre EMF signals that I clearly give off that just destroy technology. Possibly, but where we've we've we, well we've gone through so far the background to the last con store, the last con store and its closure, and really the the effect that this you know it's never enough. The San Francisco didn't just put out a big mission accomplished banner because they closed the last gun store in the city. It is the ever moving frontier. It is the you know the the endless revolution really. Mm. It's very Maoist, and that there will never be you know as long as there is one gun in the world, so there what, will I've never just, be an endpoint. I've just read the first paragraph there. Today, the California Senate Judiciary Committee passed SB 1327, private right of action legislation authored by Senator Robert Hertzberg and <laughs> sponsored by Governor Gavin Newsom to limit the spread of assault weapons and ghost guns. Following the US Supreme Court's decision last December allowing Texas's ban on most abortion services to remain in place, Governor Newsom directed his administration to work with the legislator to propose a measure modelled on the structure of Texas abortion law to enable sit private citizens to hold the gun industry accountable through civil litigation for the proliferation of illegal firearms. Well, yeah, some guy hit me on the street the other day in a Ford Focus that was stolen, so I'm going to sue Ford. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. Um, it, it's also incredibly petty. We'll go through this uh, when we talk about also, also guns are abortions. Yes, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about this when we go through the, <laughs> some of the other proposed gun laws in in twenty twenty two. I just want to go through some of the qualitative stuff here about what, on a statewide level, the rhetoric being used here mm. and what's being said about it, um, because a lot of this is very like dripping language. It's very in group language. There is no, there's no fig leaf here that the gun owning public isn't the enemy. Um, there's no fig leaf here that the firearms industry isn't the enemy. It's very out and out language, and it's very, you know, we'll we'll probably bring in the quote later that I used in in you know that you gave me actually from the American Disease article about the the Constitution because it, it's so fitting with all of this. Mm. This all takes place under the remit of the Second Amendment, apparently. This is all legal within within the California. It's all given that grace of the peaceful handover of power, and it's all given its permission really from an, it's the direct democracy in California. It's no coincidence, and why we entitled the stream "Death by Democracy," that California is the state in the U.S. with the largest amount of quote unquote direct democracy, because it allows them to go several different routes when they want to pass laws, or they want to outlaw something. If it is unpopular, they will go the top-down route. If they think they can, you know, get "quote unquote" popular support, they will go the bottom-up, you know, the bottom-up route. Mm. But they are the ones who choose which route to go through. They are the ones who choose if something will be a ballot initiative or it will go through legislative assembly on its or own. You, or you spend a couple of million dollars on a Bloomberg NGO outlet to write articles to to wag yeah. the dog for you. Well, yeah, we'll probably actually, I think, come across another trace. Um, actually, no, I didn't include it. But there's, there's some in the, the trace on its own is like a case study of of how you manufacture kind of public consent, public opinion, because the trace gets quoted by most mainstream media outlets on a lot of occasions. Mm. Um, yeah, we'll we'll go through it here. He, he's basically dripping laws about the uh, SB. 1327 allows private citizens to bring civil action against any person who manufactures, distributes, transports, imports into the state or sells assault weapons, 50 BMG rifles, ghost guns, or ghost gun kits. Some guy running about the streets of San Francisco with like a 50 cal Barrett. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, they're also trying to bring action against people in dip. I don't think this will, it, it, it's unworkable. Again, it's very symbolic legislation. Well, it says it as you. I, I don't know whether or not you 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 mentioned it when you were talking about the ghost guns, but depending on how far you want to push the legislation for what is technically a ghost gun, you through a, a law like this, 
to give yourself complete and utter right as far as the law is concerned to essentially enter every single plumbing store in the state under the auspices of the fact that they might be supplying ghost gun, ghost gun kits because they sell pipes of a certain diameter. Well, that's the ridiculous thing. There's legislation that was proposed in Washington state that would actually class billets of certain cl- like certain types of aluminium as firearms. Mm. Um, because specifically, they've said you have to manufacture guns out of this specific aluminium. And I'm not, I'm not joking. This is the actual mm. law there. They're saying that if you're manufacturing a receiver, it has to be out of this specific material. And so any billet of a sufficient size of this specific material is classed as a firearm precursor. Yeah. It's like a, it's, a, a priori, a fortiori sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm proud to be working with Governor Newsom and his administration to bring accountability to gun manufacturers and others who are flooding our streets with dangerous and deadly weapons, said Senator Hertzberg. The alarm bells are blaring. We could not have a clearer call for action to stop gun violence than what happened on Sunday at the doorstep of our state's democracy. Yeah. The legislature well, will act. What I was illustrating is that this debate, in quote, started in early 2021 in San Francisco itself with proposed legislation. And it has only spread, you know, it's spread completely, sorry, to a statewide level. And it's the pipeline there. Where goes San <clears throat> Francisco, so goes California. And where goes California, so goes the U.S. Yeah, sorry, uh, hk nine four tens had a great idea. Yeah, th- this isn't a ghost gun, it's an abortion kit. Yeah, it's a ranged postnatal abortion kit, yes. Uh, so we're just extending the, the limits to, uh, to years rather than months. Extremely progressive. Uh... Well, again, now that now that they've got the support of the of the legislative branch, they have to manufacture some consent. So, if you go to the next ABC Seven news article, what we have here is group urges passage of gun safety legislation in California. We have the the glowiest group of of people who are you know supported by oh, the most Shut like up. federal money. Shut up, a weird like weird hapa newswoman. Don't need to hear from you. Roasty check. <laughs> it's uh, there we go. Yeah, every town for gun safety and moms demand action, which are basically groups directly formed through federal money through like through Sandy Hook. Like they, they are these Sandy Hook NGOs. We'll be holding a press conference on Wednesday via Zoom. Oh <laughs> Jesus! To urge the passage, of... <laughs> I can't imagine anything worse than a mom's demand Zoom press conference. Uh, the group's press conference comes after President Joe Biden announced on Monday new federal regulation against ghost guns, fire and firearms without serial numbers. Again, that's the conflation. We'll go through it on Saturday, but that's the conflation being made here. That all guns without serial numbers, basically guns that criminals have filed on, are quote unquote ghost guns, mm. um, which are the same thing as people who've manufactured a gun. Which uh, are the same thing as guns before the age of proper serialization. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, they've got a story about you here again. Shelter in place lifted after threat prompts lockdown on Cal campus. What were you up to earlier on? I didn't do nothing. <laughs> it wasn't me, not this time. It wasn't me this time. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. But what, the, what this is going into, really, in some of the dripping language... Oh, God, they talk about the COVID-19 stuff. Um, that's kind of funny. Um, no, they they basically talk about the... DA's office. Oh god, they have an acronym that spells CARES. Where, where, um, where is that? Is that further down? It must be. Yeah, it's further down. Chief Armstrong oh, says yeah. they recovered three ghost guns in the city last year um, in Oakland. Those are guns that have had their serial numbers removed, by the way. There ain't no Brothers in the Hood 3D printing firearms. No. Um, no, there are not. Yeah. 
it's it's basically the point of this article though is to show that when we have top-down action again as we've seen with the supreme court and uh, other people have talked about civil rights in this light but when we have top-down action it's always framed as the people demand oh no of course it is that's why it's mums that are demanding action don't you know well now that we've gone through uh, i'm trying to, trying to get through there's quite a lot we have left to get through unfortunately um the real kind of meat and potatoes of this way when you look at uh Hybrid arms as a worked example of how you legislate uh, firearms sales out of existence. When you look at the state level of California, um, you start to see the exact same pattern, um, really since the 80s. Um, but we don't really have time to cover all of that. We'll just look at really the laws passed and proposed in 2021 and 2022, because they interact in some quite interesting ways. Um, and you'll you'll start to see where this is going and how the entire state of California really will end up like San Francisco, and it will be impossible to purchase or sell a firearm in California. Not because they are illegal; they will sort of technically be legal, but because uh, of there will, the, there will the be so many bureaucratic. There will yeah. be so many bureaucratic prerequisites that gun law or gun sales basically become something for what we you know california's equivalent of the land of gentry which is like weird bug men buying historical firearms with their weird tech startup money yes um well if you i think this needs to be zoomed in on a little bit unfortunately it's not the best format um i can do that yeah it's new california gun laws this has been updated uh, to show what was actually passed in 2021, because uh, there's there's quite a few to to go through here. I will actually go through probably most. Of oh, them. sorry, I've realised it's the bloody OBS window, not the Zoom. Sorry. Fixed. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, legislation passed in California. Uh, SB is Senate bill, by the way. AB is Assembly bill. Um, but that's just who created it. All of these were passed by both. But we have SB 376. Um, yeah, a person did not need a, 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 this is the redefinition of who does and doesn't require a firearms dealer's license. Um, basically what they're saying is they redefine the law to say that, um, uh, you have to, you know, you can't manufacture or transfer, um, more than six handguns a year. Uh, it used to be indefinite number of firearms in general. Uh, now it's only six total transactions per calendar year, regardless of firearm type. So this is a may. I'm, I'm surprised this hasn't been talked about more. But in California, you can't um, transact seven different times in a year without being a firearms dealer. Mm. So if you were to say, buy a handgun, not like it, sell it, buy another handgun not like it, transfer it back. Buy another handgun, not like it, transfer it back. If you were to do that with three different handguns, you didn't like them, you couldn't buy another one. Um, you would have to seek a firearm. Oh, apologies, we seem to have had a second dropout here. I'm not quite sure what's happening. Um, yeah, we do seem to be having some tech issues today, which is not actually particularly common on this show. Um, we, we used to have the occasional boomer moment with Triggs PC, but, uh, did have, uh, well, we did have the, 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 uh, the occasional like issue. Uh, as, uh, sorry, I've started streaming again, by the way. Um, yeah, you, you completely disappeared there. I don't know what's happened. Yeah, the internet keeps dropping out. Oh, we need... Uh, this... It's the same issue my laptop was having with the Wi-Fi, where it just it just gives up with the. Shall I just your streaming from now on then? Uh, probably for the the time being this evening then. Yes. Uh, apologies for that. And apologies for the probably slight decrease in quality from my stream. Um, but yeah, I'll continue with the stream then. Uh, as as the stream pusher, as it were. Kids want some stream. Um, <laughs> what are we talking about? <clears throat> oh yeah, we're talking about legislation passed in California. But basically what this means is that if you if you want to do a seventh transfer, 
Uh, and by the way, this is transfers back and forth. This this isn't just receiving a handgun. This is receiving or I think sending a handgun. Um, I'm not quite sure how they read the law. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but still six. Well, it will be it will be the same way that you would transact a title for a car. Yeah. If I'm correct in saying that, you know, your name and your details are associated with a serial number as one transaction. You then giving someone else that serial number to put alongside their details, be it be it you buying it or you selling it, I presume counts as a transaction because there must be a change of ownership unless there is maybe, you know, written into the legislation some form of grace period for up to four yeah. weeks after you purchase the firearm where yes. the transaction isn't really in your name yet and who knows. Well, um, as we see here, we also have SB 172. These are all laws that are passed, by the way. Now effective, authorize the temporary transfer. Basically, what it means is that your firearms can be temporarily given to somebody else if you are deemed as being at risk, a risk to yourself. It's, a, it's basically a private version of like red flag laws. Like someone mm -hmm. can take your firearms off you, it seems, if, if they think that you're going to harm yourself or others. But it also, it, it it's a it's a bundled law and it broadens the application of criminal storage crimes from handguns to any firearm. The whole criminal storage thing is basically if you have a gun in your house, it has to be kept in a safe at all times. Otherwise, if the police come in to inspect you, you'll be convicted for not having your gun secured, um, which means that you can't readily use them to defend yourself. Um, mm. That's the real, I think, point of the law. But the uh, yeah, that's what the safe storage law is. But basically, they they've redefined it from self safe storage of handguns to any firearm. And if you are convicted of a self storage safe storage offense, sorry. You'll be prevented from owning a firearm for ten years. That's it. It's again, this, this, these were all these are all just ones that have been passed in 2021. Um, I, I can I can keep going. Um, uh, what was the one you had mentioned earlier on beforehand? We'll get to it. That was to do with. The... We'll, we'll, we'll get to it because it interacts quite heavily with some of the proposed laws. We yeah. are going through all of these, so we will get mm -hmm. to it. That's why I wanted to make sure we had enough time for this, because I want to I want to make sure people know how onerous all of this is. Because unless you actually read into the, the the details of what these laws do, people just go, oh yeah, fi California firearms law is terrible. It's just like, well, you have to understand substantively what gets passed in a single year. Yeah. And, and yeah. So um, AB 1297, prior law permitted law enforcement agencies who issue CCW licenses to charge no more than a hundred a dollar one time registration fee. The new law removes that cap. Licensing authorities are now able to charge a fee uh, in, in quotes, an, an equal amount to the reasonable cost of processing the transaction. Basically, what this means is if a law enforcement agency in California decides that the reasonable cost of processing your application is $10,000, that's the reasonable cost. You'll have to go to court to, to challenge that. Which would cost you $10,000 probably anyway. Yes, that's kind of the point, I think. Um, so it's removed the cap. Once they've decided what a, a new reasonable level is, they can only increase it by the, by the California price index, though. But, of course, they get to decide what the reasonable level is. Mm. Um, uh, the certificate. The new law. So this is AB 645. Um, uh, basically, uh, you, um, you have to produce a massive risk assessment, basically, and a suicide prevention warning label is now required on all firearm sales from dealers, including packaging and any any descriptive materials, as well as requiring each licensed firearm dealer to post a suicide prevention warning on their premises. This is like anti-smoking law in the UK. Yeah. Uh, basically, there's going to be massive stickers all over gun stores and all over gun packaging and gun adverts that say... That this is, you know, this product is likely to make you commit suicide. Don't buy yeah, it. Yeah, this is a, a constitutionally guaranteed not being dead zone. He you is... can't kill yourself here. The constitution says yeah. so. Here's one of the laws I want you to keep in mind. EB sixty one. Um, it interacts very, very cleverly with some of the later proposed law in twenty twenty two. Prior law authorized an immediate family member or law enforcement officer to petition 
a court for a gun violence restraining order, which allows the court to remove guns from those with a substantial likelihood uh, to use them dangerously. AB61, now effective, expands the prior law by authorizing an employer, a co-worker, an employee, a teacher, or a secondary or a post-secondary school, of a secondary or post-secondary school, sorry, to petition a court for a GVRO. Keep that in mind. The, the key one here is the teachers, which is a, a basically a designated state employee of power in this situation. As you can tell by the people who are listed, it's very similar to the Scottish Named Person Scheme. Yes. If you want to explain that what that is quickly for people. Well, yeah, the, the Named Person Scheme was slightly that, or something like that, but from the other way round, whereby you were, you were given... I, I, or people who were born between a certain period were, as much as the law wasn't enacted properly, they did, and essentially de facto engage the policy and all HR organisations and basically all public employment in Scotland, whereby someone who works for a government office, police officer, community care people, people who are working privately for social care but under social care contracts, uh, I think I mean teachers, university lecturers, you know, uh, people who take like, uh, if you take like some form of like class for children that is extracurricular, but you're endorsed by the council, I believe you have the same power too, where you can basically look at the condition of a child and be like, oh, well, uh, they're clearly being abused. So I am going to be their effective guardian legally and demand that that child gets taken away into someone else's custody. And in, in the situation here, it would be that anyone who is in that position of being some, some public guardian or engaging in some sort of guardianship le legislation of wise would have the ability to say that, oh, well, uh, you're at risk of owning a firearm because you're going to hurt yourself or someone else. So I've decided to report you to the police so that any firearms, probably not just on your person, but in the home that you live, would have to be taken away from you. Um, there's actually a few here I won't talk about because I'm going to go over them in the next stream on Saturday um, because they go over some of the technological aspects I want to talk about um, but keep keep that in mind the, the SB61 I'll go over very quickly basically says that nobody under the age of 21 can buy a firearm at all even if they are a, a, an off-duty armed forces member basically so members of the armed forces can wield their duty weapons, <clears throat> but they cannot fire. They cannot buy legally a firearm in California, even though they are technically trained to operate it in a professional capacity, which is just kind of funny. Um, but the rest of them are to do with micro stamping and to do the ghost gun stuff, which I'll go over on Saturday. Uh, I'll leave. I'll leave that aside for brevity. Um, but do do keep that in mind um, because this interacts very very closely with the, uh, the the proposed gun bills of 2022. Um, this is from Cal Matters. Um, this has a few other things here. Most notably, it has... If I scroll up a bit here... Uh, this is a bit of a bullshit, unfortunately, empiricoid graph, because I'm not quite sure how they, uh, how they define a law that regulates firearm use. Um, but they have a graph here that shows that the median state has about... 20 laws that regulate firearm use, whereas California has about 111, and that number has basically doubled since about 1993. But there are 111 laws on a, on a state level in California that govern the use or purchase of a firearm. And is there any other stuff you want to go over, Evelyn, before we uh, proceed too far? Uh, I'm just trying to find where that graph you're looking at is. <laughs> Every time I load this page up, it's got it's always got them in a different order. Oh, that's unfortunate. It's a couple of ones above it, but it's just it's just a graph. Uh, number of laws go up, basically. Hmm. Well, no, the the thing that we talked about briefly in the pre-show is that they they try to argue the toss here that you know mm. because california has more gun laws than other states on average therefore that explains why it has less gun deaths on average which well, it, the gun death statistic is dodgy anyway and how you define what is a law and what's a bylaw and what's yeah. you know all the, 
it is in and of itself also dodgy. And purely, you can just look at the case of Chicago, which has, you know, as we said, some of, some of the strictest gun laws in America, and yet has the highest, if not one of the highest per capita well, rates of gun yeah. homicide, if you don't just count, like, the D.C. area as an area on its own. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, the, the problem with California is that, uh, like all states, they class a gun death as a suicide as well. Mm. Now, you'll find that suicides by other methods are more common, but quote-unquote gun deaths are quote-unquote lower because of the less, there's less suicides by gun and more suicides by other methods. If you look at homicides per 100,000, uh, California is relatively average, with very, very low homicides in rural areas and affluent gated communities, and very, very high homicides in specific areas. Uh, mm. So it's it's very similar to a lot of other U.S. states. It has a lot more homicides per 100,000 people than, say, a lot of the northern Midwest states, which have lower populations but far laxer gun laws. Yeah, but somewhere like Montana or something like that. <laughs> yes, it very much seems to track um, in terms of affluence and demographics more than it does with firearms laws, but that's a completely different stream. Well, see, I think the, the, the one of the things you were want, I know you were wanting to focus on, though, is... Uh, They've got the thing there above the graph you were looking at prior to. Uh, researchers at Boston University have counted 111 California laws that in some way restrict the manner and space in which firearms can be used. They include regulations on dealers and buyers, background check requirements, and possession bans directed at certain, in quotes, high-risk individuals. Yeah. You know, how do they know that these 111 laws don't all just contradict each other or make it so much of a minefield that you know, the average person goes, ah, nah, fuck it, I can't even bother. Well, that's that's the aim, really. The aim here is to do that. Um, the the big one here, we've already talked about the private citizens one, basically the very, very petty bill that they're doing as a response to Texas. They're ba- it's basically mm. a fuck you Texas bill. Um, the, the whole abortion law mirroring one. Um, that's that's uh, SB 1327. Uh allow gun violence victims to sue gun manufacturers and distributors who fail to establish reasonable control to protect public health and safety. Again, this is very difficult and actually contradicts federal law and I don't think is very workable, but it, it, mm. this is, I think, aimed at running manufacturers out of California. This is very much squarely aimed at trying to stop people from doing any kind of firearms manufacturing in California itself. I think that's the point of that law. Rather than to substantively impact the the national firearms industry which arguably it actually it may again california wagging the dog through its own insane law is something that has happened previously mm. um uh this is again ab 1621 is a ghost gun in quotes law um ab 2571 is hilarious because it says that you can't advertise firearms or ammunition to minors which i guess it will probably create a very hard test on that which will basically be impossible um, yeah well that's that is take guns out of video games legislation in a mm. lot of ways yes it is um i think basically what it does it'll mean that any any video game that uh, has a gun in it will be modified in california <laughs> possibly or uh, or at least higher rated in california it'll be like the whole thing in uh, germany about uh all oh, like the corpses turn into boxes and like Call of Duty games and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, the big one here I want to talk about though is mm. um, SB 906, which interacts with the law we talked about previously about gun violence restraining orders. Um, it will require school districts to survey parents about whether they have firearms in the home and how they are stored. School districts would also be required to report any perceived threat of a mass shooting event to law enforcement. So basically what this creates is a dual purpose like hall monitor set of laws in which a school is required to ask parents and there'll probably be a survey, a provision under law that parents are compelled legally to answer these questions. And if they answer these questions falsely because they have to register their firearms with the state, they will know. Uh, it creates I'm sure, a... I remember what the uh, the Mussolini quote about the state and fascism is. You know, like everything, everything under the state, everything for the state, or whatever it is. You know, in San Francisco, it's everything, everything under the 
public education for the public education. You know, it's, it is so of the, the, the sort of mindset that we've talked about a number of times now when we looked at some of the Paul Gottfried and Sam Francis stuff about the, the, the yes. early ruminations of what became sort of the, the, the theory of therapeutic state. But that's just smacks of that kind of stuff really heavily because you know in and about that legislation there is the most pithy, poorly formed arguments about how well, if children go up in, in environments where they're normalized to firearms, they're only one step away from being the next Hitler, guys. Basically, yes. Um, there's also here... Yes, there we go. Everything within the state, nothing against the state, nothing outside the state. This, but with education. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, they will also ban the sale of firearms on state property. Uh, this would it, it's effectively aimed at uh, stopping gun shows from taking place at county and state fairs. So you'd struggle to find large venues that could hold a gun show now, uh, because basically anything that's classed as state property, you're not allowed to to, to um, sell firearms on. Um, uh, here's another one. Again, we'll talk about this next time. But I don't want to talk about it quickly here. AB twenty one fifty six require anyone who uh, produces more than four firearms per year um, either by milling or use of a 3D printer to get a gun manufacturing license. Basically, if you want to transfer multiple guns a year or manufacture multiple guns a year, you need to be a firearms dealer, which is very hard to be in California. So they are, again, tightening the grip here. And this number will probably be reduced and reduced and reduced. And it's very much going to be, well, why do you need more than one gun a year? Well, yeah, it will get to the point whereby if if you want to own a firearm in any way, shape, or form, you would probably have to put yourself down as a manufacturer yeah. or some sort of boutique gunsmith, because it would, because otherwise, you know, if you, you know, ATF officer knocks on your door and you, oh, you've no, got the thing Mr. half ATF, apart, please. you know, you've got the thing oh, half no. apart because you're fixing it, and then, well, you know, you've, well, that's not a completed firearm; it's obviously a ghost gun. So, you know, unless you're, unless you've got your manufacturing license there, <laughs> um, I'll go over this again when we do the the stream proper on Saturday. But have you ever heard of the term constructive possession? Uh. I think you might have mentioned it before at some point. It's quite funny because under federal law, uh, if you have, if technically, if you have the components to make what could be considered a shot by old rifle, mm. they they can argue that you are in constructive possession. Um, this is why a lot of the kind of pistol brace legislation is so dangerous because even if you disassemble your your uh, your gun. Even if you take the brace off your AR pistol, and you or your you repurpose your braces as stocks for your rifle length guns, uh, you can still be held in constructive possession. You still have the components necessary to make a short barred rifle. Therefore, you have a short barred rifle. Therefore, you are a felon. And that that is an argument that isn't made very often, but it's one that legally can be made. And so, it is... if I'm right there, if you own a certain type of stock on another weapon and you also own an AR pistol then that's technically illegal because you own those two separate items and could in theory combine them yes have I, have I got that right yes that is the that is the concept of constructive possession it's legally quite shaky i'm not sure they'll be able to do it yet but it is something that has it has reared its head a few times um that if you have the components you know the the quote unquote precursors to a shot barrel rifle, you are violating the ATF, sorry, the, the NFA, and therefore a felon. And mm. I think a lot of the talk of the 3D printed guns and homemade guns is actually, it's moving towards that. You're, you're going to get to the situation in which if you have certain unused components, you'll be held as a felon as well. Basically, it makes it, it impossible to own certain items uh, without risk, which is a lot of the, a lot of the suppressor stuff is based on, but I'm, I'm moving too far into what we'll be doing on Saturday. Mm. Yes. Um, what we see here as well, um, it, California and San Francisco are no longer on the forefront. Sorry, San Francisco is no longer on the forefront of gun laws. It seems that San Jose has gone hold my beer, basically. <laughs> um, 
um, back in 2021, San Jose uh, emulated San Francisco's law on videotaping gun purchases. Um, and they basically passed an identical law, which meant that um, all gun purchases have to be uh, filmed, they have to be held for five years, they, you have to give weekly reports to your local police department. They basically created the, the, the law in San Jose, which created a situation in San Francisco where there were no gun stores operating. Hmm. So San Jose is saying very loudly that we do not want gun stores here. We want to emulate San Francisco and we want to close all the gun stores because we want to create as onerous legislation as possible. But I think a few hung on. So we ended up with a situation where San Jose now requires separate public liability insurance for gun owners. So if you own a firearm in San Jose, you have to basically purchase like the equivalent of car insurance, like mandatory car insurance here. Uh, you have to have like separate public liability on top of the fees that you would pay to uh, to have a concealed carry license. Because this isn't just concealed carry, this is simply owning a firearm. So it even goes further than like car insurance laws. In that if you have a gun on your own property that never leaves your property, you will still have to get liability insurance. I was say I, I quickly googled there to have a look. It seems that there is actually quite a number of gun stores sell in San Jose. Yes, um, it's a different place in San Francisco, and I imagine I know, it's, it's, a... it's the it's the the bit I was talking about when you go further south in the Bay Area, and it doesn't get particularly good. <laughs> um, they also have a law requires all gun owners to pay a basically a, a, a yearly tax they have an annual fee it's only a 25 dollar fee but it's still basically a kafir tax <laughs> it's it's a it's a gun it's it's a literal gun owner tax in which it, and it's kind of symbolic um but they they very clearly have a you are not welcome here tax going on um and it, it goes further even than I think San Francisco does in terms of how it targets gun owners. Oh, um, because they, they didn't let you go any further in San Francisco. No. Um, again, they promised to sue, blah, 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 but this will probably put a few gun stores out of business. And again, that's kind of the point, or at least prevent a few people from buying you know, guns for self-defense, which again is the point. Mm. Um, and it really is, you know, the, the frontier is never ending. Uh, there will never be an end to the frontier. Um, anything to add? <laughs> well, just to, the, the, you know, under the ordinance, gun retailers must train employees to question and determine whether each potential customer is attempting to buy a firearm for another person. They must also display signs with information about gun laws, suicide prevention, and domestic violence. Businesses will have three months to comply with a new rule. Yeah, it's very much them taking up the mantle of a lot of the combined stuff that's been put in place for California in general. So that, so that, just double check, this stuff is in force in San Jose then. You know, yes. if, you, if you go to a gun store in San Jose, you will be it's not in, I, I, monitored yeah, I think... and basically like psychologically screened. Yes. Before you can uh, take your receipt home and wait 30 days for your firearm to arrive. Yes. On top of all of California's federal laws, yes. Mm. Uh, I, it's quite well funny because I remember there was the whole thing during the pandemic of California gun owners. Uh, well, during the lockdowns. I, I shouldn't use that parlance. During the lockdowns, the San Francisco um, kind of residents and you know, Californians in general attempted to buy guns being incredibly unhappy with the state of uh, of firearms laws and mm. being extremely disturbed that they couldn't just go into a Walmart and buy a gun like they'd been told yeah. they could. It's like a, a lot of people... I like, thought this was America. It basically, yeah, it's quite funny. I don't know, they, they get what they deserve, but... Uh, well, see, I just, I just... I don't know. We can maybe jump to the one because I, I, I find it all kind of funny that... <clears throat> Your uh, High Bridge Law Enforcement Supplies and Arms, Inc. Uh, the last gun shop in San Francisco is turning into a weed dispensary. 
and a non-profit weed dispensary, mind you. Not just any any kind of dispensary. They, sh they could still <laughs> call it Highbridge as well. Oh, Sorry. That's terrible. The, yeah, the Bernal Heights Cooperative, which has been in the neighbourhood for 10 years, is being evicted and the board needed to find a new home. Yeah, basically they've turned it into the new home for the, the weed shop. Wow. All, all the regime libertarians cheer. Like, how do you sell weed and not make money? Like, what's the point? I th <laughs> what is, is it, it like? What is it like? Eight bucks a gram or something? I, I doubt it is. <laughs> no, it, it's exceptionally expensive. I've seen it in uh, Washington. In, uh, sorry, in Seattle. Like, dispensary weed is ridiculous, and most people still buy it on the grey market. Um, which is kind of funny, but. Yeah, so yeah, this, the was, this was the is waiting for the city to approve the space to become a medical cannabis dispensary. So they just own the vacant lot of that building. Now. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, to respect the building's history, the dispensary will keep the yeah. name Highbridge. Fortunately, it works for us as well. <laughs> it's, it's. This is literally. Like, this is. Again, this almost feels like ritual humiliation. Yeah. We're keeping See, that, the name, that, guys. I was say, this is only from 2016 as well. Yes, it is. Basically, the dispensary as the... will have price points for everybody. So what? You'll sell mids? Cool, bro. <laughs> like, cool. Mid. Ugh. Terrible. I don't know. Is there any other, any other links in here we should go through quickly? Uh, there's the whole... What I want to talk about is is a rounding out of why this stems from the concept of a lot of it from the concept of, of mass democracy. Uh, would you like the Fox article? I take it. Well, I'm running the stream, so. No, 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 you are. But <laughs> it I no, <laughs> my stream. Um, yes, we're going to talk about the Vox article. So I'm a bit twitchy with my my clicking here. I think I should probably move this one down here. There we go. That that fixes that issue. Um, yes, but we have a Vox article here from 2020 uh, called California's uh, Ballot Initiative System Isn't Working. How do we fix it? Basically, the, the whole ballot initiative thing is California's direct democracy scheme. Um, God, I just realized the, the, the section in Vox that this is written under is uh, Future Perfect, Finding the Best Ways to Do Good. Yeah, but my little sense is tingling. It very it, again, it is very double plus code here. It does, it does have the the big allure, uh, but it's it's kind of you can see it from the other direction. It's them basically admitting that their their utopia isn't working, and that God, yeah, like they really are getting to like the this is proper like Soviet nonsense. I live in California, and three weeks before the election, the people in my quarantine quarantine bubble sat down in our living room for a nine-hour research project figuring out how to vote not for our elected representatives or for president but on kidney dialysis regulations and stem cell medical research funding and whether and whether to uphold a law passed by the legislature replacing cash bail with a risk assessment system jesus <laughs> christ and nine more propositions after those my ballot was six pages long, many of them on issues I never thought about before, and after a few frustrating hours, figuring out how to vote, we'll never think about it again. God, that's the present-mindedness of democratic governance summed up perfectly in well, a sentence or two. It's a great example of Soviet democracy, and a lot of people mm. laugh at you when you say that, but uh, people have essentially been like psyoped into thinking that the Soviet Union didn't endlessly vote on everything, which it did. Uh, yeah. There were, you know, bus councils, there were workers' unions to decide, you know, what coal would be distributed where, there were, f you know, f essentially like forestry boards and there was a huge amount of stuff to do with transport and housing, and there are many people in the 1920s talks about uh, the Soviet Union's problem being that it had too much democracy. God, yeah. And... The, I would say the, the language of how this is written, not to interrupt you there. Oh yeah, go on. It, direct democracy can be a profound and important tool for political change, and 2020 had many examples of that. In several states, voters decriminalized drugs. The voters did it. Yeah. So there is there is no such thing as a legislatory board. You just all take a sheet 
someone counts all the sheets and then it's it. We all understand that it's now decriminalised. <laughs> <laughs> decriminalise drugs from marijuana to mushrooms, sending a powerful message to lawmakers that their constituents are done with the war on drugs. You are choosing from the lawmakers' choices on criminalisation and decriminalisation. If they didn't want you to choose it, they wouldn't let you vote on it. <laughs> well, the next paragraph is, is amazing, because they say that, but what doesn't benefit from... Uh, what, what it doesn't benefit from is a system like California's, where ballots get padded out and weighed down with unclearly written ballot propositions on a dozen niche issues. So you, the, the executive and the power structure gets to decide what isn't, isn't a niche issue. Then you, hmm. you give that to the people to reaffirm, and then they take that back. That essentially makes the process meaningless. What, what, what pro, you know, quote-unquote real domestic, direct democracy would be would be a fire hose of continuous voting in which you'd have thousands of these initiatives to vote on every day <laughs> and you, you, it... you can you can tell in the way that it's written as well you know if you continue on that you know where voters have been asked to simultaneously entertain abolishing and expedi expediting the death penalty to weigh dueling uh, to weigh dueling propositions about plastic bags to advise the state legislature to overturn u.s supreme court decisions in brackets it cannot do that I'm sure if this person was talking about firearms legislation, they wouldn't care to mention that point. No. And now, on two different occasions, to weigh in on the proper running of dialysis clinics leads the pack. Well, <clears throat> it's a great, it's a great thing about like the neutral state. It's like, well, these are obviously ridiculous things for voters to vote on. But well, that's that's why the. I mean, I'm just waiting for them to say it because they, they put in the, the lead up here, you know, a system that funnels lots of issues, both big and small, directly to the voters leads to bad policy judgments because under-informed voters don't have time to research and form opinions on all the issues. I can tell already by the use of not uninformed, but under-informed. The, the solution here is not less democracy. It's more education with more democracy on top. <laughs> yes, that's it's it, state problems require state solutions. Uh, the course. reason I want to, to include this is it's extremely therapeutic state, and it really does feed into again there's the stuff about how about initiatives work here, blah blah blah, lessons from California. There really isn't a huge amount here that we need to pick through. We'll probably come back to this at some point. Um, I think. Let me let me. Oh, it doesn't have the word education. Um, but it probably has a similar concept. I'm trying to figure out whether rounding out paragraph is here. Um, yeah. How to make democ direct, direct democracy work. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Tell me about it. I've got a bridge to sell you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically to just say that we need less democracy to have more democracy. Well, the, the the issue here, though, is that there is the I, I can't. Somebody mentioned it uh, the other day on a Telegram when I looked at some other sort of policy and took the piss out of it. But you know, like, okay, you can you can engage in this small amount of direct democracy in California and enact law lo laws locally in either your your district or your state, but that that doesn't mean that these laws per se work. No, you know the we trying to then measure the effect relative to other systems of law or in situations where the law is adapted federally. Then you 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 then just can't do any testing whatsoever. So it's for them to then you know we we have some results from the, those laboratories of democracy, and they suggest that the initiative system works best when there are a manageable number of initiatives on the ballot at election time. Voter participation is high, and voters are more able to focus their attention on a handful of meaningful, high-value issues. Of course. Should we legalise marijuana? Should we re-enfranchise people who have been convicted of a crime and served their sentence? Should we change how our state votes? Of course, these yeah. issues curated and put forward by the managerial class. Yeah, well, no, of they, course. They're, they're, they're calling for managerialism, basically. This is an appeal to the managerialist to decide well, yeah, what is and isn't important. The, the final paragraph, there, a direct democracy is a part of our system because of a belief that voters deserve a direct say in how their state is run. The best implementation gives voters a very high meaningful choices, well worth their time. If we can't manage that, we're not empowering voters, we're burdening them. 
I mean, I'm not going to like go through the whole, oh, of the, the such and such, the founding fathers would be stacking bodies, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, if you want to go right back to, you know, the, the Mayflower and like the actual setting up of the first colonies in America, when people try pulling this direct democracy shit, the, the direct democracy shit, they get fucking capped. Right yeah, they quick. did. <laughs> but it's, you know, it comes right back round to, I think, something you were going to mention earlier on, which is a, a great piece, or the great sort of a line of thought from Lysander Spooner. You know, the, uh, he's talking about uh, the, the Constitution. I can't remember what he calls it, Constitution something of treason or whatever else. But, you know, if, if the Constitution cannot direct, or directly protect you from the government's influence upon you in any way, shape or form, then all it does then is surely it facilitates government oppression upon yourself as opposed to defending you from it. Well, here's the quote that I put in my American disease. He just says, but whether the Constitution really be one thing or another, this much is certain, that it has either authorized such a government as we have had, or it has yes. been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. <laughs> Which is a very pithy way of saying, America has the Constitution, reality exists, these two things are irreconcilable. <laughs> hmm. But but yeah, but because there is that that notion of self-governance that is in aspects of the Constitution, and that we wouldn't, un you know, me and you or the, and the people in the chat understand that, you know, when we were talking about the ability for San Francisco as a, a community to self-determine in some way, shape or form because it's able to defend itself, that's self-governance, you know, that's you really having power as an entity that that doesn't require any institutional backing because you are literally armed to the teeth. Yes. Whereas, you know, that gets replaced and slowly warped into this notion of democracy where your your self-governing powers are all institutional. They are not sporadic and decentralized. There's a there's a clip I'm going to get up here which is uh which is very very appropriate. You, you won't be able to hear it but the the I think the people at home will, so I'll I'll grab this in a sec, but it's, uh, there we go. The charge, eating a meal, a succulent Chinese meal. American Express investigator followed a man, he... Th oh, I need to, oh, he's, he doesn't say it there. What is the charge? He is... There we go. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. What there we go, that's the, that's the Democracy Manifest quote. Um... <laughs> I just, I love the way he says that. I, he, he's a crazy uh, Dine and Dasher, but it's a, it's a great clip. Um, gentlemen. <laughs> Get your hands off my penis. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, have that bit up. A succulent Chinese meal. That's a, that's a very good clip. But no, the, the last thing I want to cover here is the, uh, it's the, it's kind of the, the smoking gun here, which is California's Prop 63. Which is, I think, the biggest lurch in firearms laws that California's had in the last five years, I'd say. It's probably going to come to another one, but mm. Proposition 63 was a ballot initiative for background checks on all ammunition purchases and the banning of quote-unquote large-capacity magazines. So magazines are basically over 10 rounds. And this was put to the California uh, you know, public, and it was approved by... I think about 63, 63 to 36%. Yes. Um, but what's funny here is that uh, part of the initiative is now in limbo uh, because... The... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Proposition 47 in 2014 made stealing an item that is valued at less than $950 a misdemeanor. Therefore, stealing a gun valued at less than $950 is a misdemeanor. Proposition 63 made stealing a gun, including one valued at less than $950, a <laughs> felony punishable by up to three years. It's like, oh god, we've got to plug the we've got to plug the legislatory gap where people are people are stealing guns that cost $949 and getting away with it as if it was a petty crime. That was <laughs> that is a very funny part of it. Uh yeah, it changes to state law. Um yeah, it's it's again, it's it's just hilarious, but People have to live in this mess. Um, no, yeah, they don't. It's, 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 
<laughs> they don't. Well, they don't have to now. That's a, again a separate discussion. What's funny here is the amount spent on a ballot initiative. Apparently, e- uh, the surface money for this was over five million dollars worth of campaigning, which is extraordinary for a single ballot measure. The um, the, the anti-gun grifts are. It's a profitable grift, that. Well, the the amount of money spent was apparently five to one. Um, <clears throat> it's is there's a lot of interesting stuff on this. Uh, I don't know, it, sometimes it's not great ballotpedia, but this one actually seems pretty well filled out um, because it really it really does show that back in uh, 1982 there was a, a ballot initiative that actually failed miserably uh, about the registration of handguns, which is very very you know a lot less extreme than the the uh, firearms laws we have now. But what hmm. this shows is that ballot initiatives. Um, coupled with a uh, a legislative process that continuously tries to firehose out these laws, will eventually create a situation in which either people vote yes or a legislative body votes yes. And yeah. If you keep repeating it, if you keep going through the democratic cycle, eventually they say yes, and they never have a ballot about it. It's, you know, it's a set, it's a settled subject once they get the result they want. Um, and I, Proposition sixty three is a great example of that because. I don't think if, you know, quote-unquote public opinion were to swing back the other way, they would never have another ballot initiative on it. It wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be permissible. And yet we see it here with Proposition 63, in that I think that was probably too extreme for the legislature, but by putting it to the voters, they've been able to lurch the laws in a yeah. in a restricted direction and say, well, the people demanded it. So... Yeah, the 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 thirty five percent of state le- legislators have appealed to the sixty five percent of the electorate, and won a sort of quasi majority sort of mandate through that by not actually having a governing minority. They have roped the people into creating the the, the popular sentiment of governance. Yes, and that's where we find ourselves. Really, that's. That's the story of the last gun store in San Francisco and how the implications that closed it are the same processes that um, are driving kind of restrictions on a statewide level. It's a great Mm. example of how bureaucracy as generated by, you know, local and state and then, you know, national democracy in the U.S. has created a situation in which people's rights do not exist because of weight of legislature and through the cycle of just vote again, basically. Yeah, that's very EU. It's extremely EU, yes. Is there anything it's, to... it's the Lisbon Treaty of uh, gun legislation. Check. We don't have any more donations or super chats. I'm sorry about the technical issues, guys. We'll try and get those sorted for next yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what to do in that front, because that kind of... I don't know if it's going to be consistently dropping out. That upends possibly my plans that I had for next month. Which I might as well ask people about in chat whilst they are there, and I have their ear at the end of the uh, stream. Uh, I have been lucky enough to be given the opportunity to go to Mises University this year, and providing some logistical things can be worked out. There is no reason why I can't go. The only slight hitch might be that I might be looking to fundraise uh, my flights. And I'm planning to do that by essentially reading human action at length, maybe reading the whole thing of it, depending on whether or not I reach the goal for the funding before I reach the end of the book or however that works out. But if, I don't know, if people in the chat would would support that and would actually, I don't know, even if there's only like 10 people out there would listen to the length of it, that's all I need. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll try and we'll try and publicize that more. Uh, we have had a little bit of a limited reach with this stream since because it kept going offline so often. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll figure something out. That that can be that can be that can be worked out. That can be fixed. I think. Um, well, if I need to stream, I can stream because this has been very consistent. Actually. Yeah. Um, I just prefer because you've got the faster internet technically, and I I do occasionally. It's have just work. I would be I would be doing that probably during the day and all sorts of strange times to try and get through as much of it as possible. Right? Yeah, yeah, I know that. We we can try and figure out what's going on on your end with the streams. 
Mm. Um, but thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys again for sticking with us during the technical issues. Uh, we'll yes. be back. I'll be well. Me and Trig will be back with our guest, Mr. Spookware, on Saturday at about 10 p.m. I'll probably put the pre-stream up for that tomorrow, so watch out for that. Um, I don't think we have much else to show. Someone's asking me what the, the funding target would hopefully be no more than about a thousand pounds, really. I think that's probably what the total cost of my flights. I mean, there, there will be other travel and other things, but if that main chunk can be helped by my many, my many internet friends, then that would be greatly appreciated. There we go. Uh, um, what we also what we're going to have... mention is. Sorry. I was going to mention as well the fact you're talking about future streams uh we will also be streaming with uh radlib on monday that will be at a later time though so that'll be half nine uk time yes it will be um we also have the Substack, as you guys know about i've been showing that for a little bit but um we've had quite a few articles over the past couple months or so i've got a couple i need to finish my written version of my speech because there's a couple of structural issues with it uh, i've not had time to fix yet You've got your Why Settle for Less, which was quite popular. I quite enjoyed that one. Um, so do, in fact, zoom in, it looks bad on the stream, but do come and check out Antipolitics. Uh, link is down below. We do have written content, and there, there is more longer form content forthcoming. Um, apart from that, I don't have much else to show. Um, you've, no. you've already done your, your uh, you know, stream marathon, so. Before we get too long in the tooth, I will say thank you guys for watching and good night. Goodbye.